Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning, distinguished guests and fellow colleagues. My name is Ying Shan, and I'm from the Centre for Livable Cities. Welcome to today's book launch and talk on new lenses on future cities. In today's session, we are honoured to have with us Mr. Jeremy Bentham, Vice President of Global Business Environment at Shell and Head of its Scenarios team, who will share with us about future energy scenarios and its relation to cities. Following the talk would be a panel discussion and Q&A with Mr. Julian Go, CLC's acting director and content contributor to the book. The session today would be moderated by Professor Michael Kwa, CEO of Methanol Institute and adjunct professor, chemical and biomolecular engineering at the National University of Singapore. Um, before the session begins, we would like to welcome Mr. Ku Teng Chai, Executive Director of the Centre for Livable Cities, to give the opening remarks. Mr. Ku, please. Good morning, and uh, I think everybody was saying Happy New Year. Then we, I met Sharon Siddiqui and said we are in between New Year's. So I think it should be Happy New Year's, right? Since it's kind of <laughs> and somebody else told me that... Uh, Today is a very special day, you know, it's, it's not Tai Pusan, but what's the name of the festival? Uh, huh? Tai, tai, tai Pongol, right? Which is a very auspicious day, apparently. So, so it's my pleasure to, 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 let, uh, to welcome all of you to this joint event that's uh, organized by the Center for Livable Cities and, and Shell. Uh, the CLC was established in 2008. Uh, by the Ministry of National Development and the Ministry of Environment and Water Resources with a mission to distill, to create and to share knowledge in livable and sustainable cities. So besides actively engaging our local stakeholders, primarily the 22 government agencies uh, who really form our knowledge base, uh, we also share Singapore's experience, expertise and emerging challenges with other cities and work with them uh, including international experts and partners. And Shell, in particular, uh, has been a long-term partner of Singapore, having established a presence here as far back as 1891. Sorry. So both Shell and CLC recognize that while there are challenges of urbanization, opportunities are also plentiful in cities that want to become more livable, more sustainable, and competitive. So in early 2012, Shell and CLC signed a three-year Memorandum of Understanding to collaborate on research, publications and events on urban management and solutions. So this publication that is being launched today is the culmination of the joint research collaboration during which CLC shared its knowledge, particularly about Singapore's development experience. About the book, the publication looked at different types of cities, how they may evolve and the conditions which shape how well they adapt and reform to external change. A chapter on Singapore, co-authored with the CLC, shows Singapore's journey to become a densely populated while livable city through dynamic urban governance and integrated master planning and development. It also explores what factors enable cities to have room to manoeuvre instead of, instead of being in a trapped transition. But I think you'll hear all that from from the expert who is going to share with us. I think Jeremy Bentham is no stranger to this series. He's Shell's uh, Vice President of the Global Business Environment and he's the authority on scenario planning in Shell. And he's going to share with us today about, about uh, the project and the book in particular. So I hope that this publication will inspire all stakeholders of cities to steer their cities towards a more livable and sustainable future. Um, so before I, I leave the rostrum and, and introduce, uh, uh, invite Jeremy to take over, uh, I, I've been reminded uh, by Sharon that there's a wonderful exhibition going on. Some of you may already have seen it, but for those of you who have not seen it, I think there's only a few days left for the exhibition. I think it's, a, it's an exhibition of the master plan of Singapore. Uh, done by the URA. Uh, the Master Plan of Singapore is updated once every five years. Uh, and this one uh, is a major review uh, by URA and they have 
exhibited all the new plans, the new visions, the new ideas of, for Singapore uh, throughout Singapore at the building next to this building. If you, if you, if you get out of this building, the URA building is, is just neighboring this building and it's on the ground floor. Uh, it's, it's a very, very good exhibition. So I think after this talk, I think, you know, if you have, you have an hour or so, uh, it's, it's time well spent to go and visit the exhibition on the master plan of Singapore. So with that, uh, Jeremy, all yours. Yeah. Nope. Oh, I am now. There we go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the welcome. And uh, it, it is indeed a massive pleasure to be here and to, uh, to speak with you. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, thank you for the work that we've, uh, we've done together with CLC to bring this piece of work together that I'm going to be sharing with you. And I hope you find that the little booklets you have to take away will be valuable as well. The, um, the real pleasure is to be able to do this in Singapore. Uh, now, you may think, because I travel a lot, that I say this wherever I go to, but it's absolutely genuine for me here in Singapore. I, I first came to Singapore in about 1985. I've been here, on average, two, maybe three times per year since. Uh, my sister-in-law lives here and is married to a Singaporean. Uh, I've, I've, I've experienced Singapore for almost 30 years now. And I just wish I could have experienced it for the 30 years before that as well. It's a, uh, been a wonderful experience. Obviously, this is the first time that I'm giving this talk as we're beginning to launch this piece of work uh, into the public dialogue. And so please forgive me if I make mistakes or stumble over things. In fact, help me, because with your knowledge, uh, you know more about some of these things than I do. So please do be a part of kind of helping me through the, uh, the process of speaking for about half an hour or so. Um, I'm going to be uh, using this clicker, so let me make sure that it works. Uh, as has been said, I have the privilege of being the head of Shell Scenarios. And I do point out that whilst I may be the head, the brain is outside the head. The, the brain is in the team, but also the huge network within Shell and the even bigger network outside of Shell that contributes to our thinking about global challenges and about the way energy and other systems may develop over the years ahead. And clearly we do this, uh, not because it's fun, but it is fun, but also because we're involved in helping people make richer and better decisions now by having a more informed understanding of the pressures that are shaping the future. And clearly, we believe that urban development is one of those future sh shaping activities. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the future. And clearly, it's important to recognize that the future isn't predictable. But neither is it completely random. There are intelligent ways of thinking about the future. Now, as a company, you may know the joke that's made about us, that we're a company of Dutch engineers and Scottish accountants. <laughs> yeah, we're we're kind of nerds, in a sense. Yeah, we're engineering numerate types. Uh, but also, we're a company which has got some United States lawyers within it. Uh, and they have a particular way of thinking about the future. And so, just to kind of represent that way of thinking about the future. Uh, yeah. My assumption is that you're now able to read this uh, and that you're all mentally clicking the I accept button. And that will enable me to continue. But there is a certain point here that people have different ways of handling the uncertainty of the future. I don't think this is a particularly productive way of handling it. The way that Shell has, for now more than 40 years, considered pressures for the future is through scenarios that recognize, indeed, that whilst the future isn't predictable or controllable, there are rational ways of considering it that help you make the, these better decisions. And so 
last year, we introduced into the public dialogue our recent scenarios. And I think you've also got a, a booklet that um, refers to those, the new lens scenarios. And uh, I'm not going to go through those in this lecture. Please look at the book if you're interested in going more deeply. Uh, also, I have to say, uh, you can tell I'm the kind of age who has grown up children. Uh, but amongst our children, we still have a teenage son. And my teenage son believes that I am the least cool person on the planet. <laughs> you know the kind of pressures there. But he does think that the app on the new lens scenarios is OK. Uh, so, <laughs> so if you're interested, you can go to the website or go on the iTunes store and, and download the Shell Scenarios app. Uh, and over time, supplements like this city work will appear there as well. So it's a useful way of keeping up to date on this kind of work. Now, the, the big global panoramas that we speak about, we call mountains and oceans. And just to give you a sense of them, uh, you think of a mountain, just, just your image of a mountain. Clearly, you know, that's something in which you know, there are peaks, and it's hard to, to climb the mountain. So it's actually a world in which influence and privilege concentrate. It's also a world in which you have a situation where stability is greatly valued. But you also have rigidities as a result of that. So you can get some economic disappointments. But also, as on a mountain, if the pressures come together, some things can move quickly. So if the forces align, you can get developments, such as in urban planning, that are able to move quite quickly. The ocean's world, you think of the ocean, what does the ocean bring to mind? Vast currents that can move things quickly. It's a world in which influence spreads far and wide, where you unlock economic productivity. But also, wherever there's a current, you have a countercurrent. So it can mean that you can move quickly in some directions, but not others. It's harder to align the forces to move certain things forward. Now, amongst the things we've learned from these scenarios, which really explore very different worlds, is that, indeed, urbanization is one of the key developments. It's a predetermined trend. It has an important impact whichever scenario you're looking in. You know, the equivalent in the world of one new Singapore every month for the next 30 years. That has a big impact on all aspects of world development, obviously socially and politically, but in terms of resources, water, energy, food, all these areas, very, very important. And in fact, one of the critical uncertainties we've seen in our outlooks is the pattern of urban development and whether urban development proceeds effectively or less effectively. And hence this particular focus now on urbanization. So from an energy perspective, you can see what's happening in a world that is moving towards having approximately 9 billion people by 2050 and these resource draws that come about because of population growth, but even more so because of growing prosperity in the world. And if you look from an energy perspective, which is a perspective we naturally look from, uh, you can see from this chart how, first of all, energy demand is growing, but also how it's largely growing in the urban environment. Uh, essentially, most of the new people on the planet, net terms, are in these new urban centers. And most of the net energy growth is in these urban centers. So we have to get our minds around these areas of resource, and energy is our opening perspective. So if we think about global energy, uh, I refer to this as my London underground map. Uh, does the MRT map look a bit like this as well? I, I, I know you're growing the MRT as well, so it'll be changing. But this just kind of gives a sense of global energy uh, moving from the primary sources through to its use. 
And there's some important features in this. Uh, the lines here are approximately to scale. And you can see that one significant aspect is that uh, half of energy that is from primary energy ends up as effectively waste heat. There are a lot of inefficiencies along the way. And if you begin to consider where those are, then you see the impact of city development again. So if you really focus on transport and on power generation, you can see that the way that cities develop with, for example, good public transport, compact cities with shorter traveling distances, the capacity to introduce new forms of uh, drives such as electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, all have an impact on transport. The capacity to integrate infrastructures, uh, water, waste, power generation, power generation with uh, combined cooling, heat and power are all ways of using energy more efficiently. And those are features that are really shaped by the form of urban development. As an example, this is a well-known chart from the literature of, on the vertical axis, the amount of energy used for transport in different cities and the density of population in those cities. And of course, it has a huge impact, as you can see, between those more sprawling, let's call them North American forms of city development, through to the more dense uh, European forms uh, and the, uh, the Asian forms. It has a big impact. In fact, if you look at it at national level or even regional level, on average, your average United States citizen uses three times as much energy for personal transport as the average European. And the reason for that is only partially because of the size and efficiency of the vehicles. It's largely as a result of the fact that they drive twice as far. And they drive twice as far because the city model that has evolved has been one on a sprawling basis with poor public transport on average. So it has a huge impact. And you see that reflected in other forms of uh, resource use as well. So this is just taking, uh, this is emissions, but obviously it's related to energy as well. Uh, and this is an example within a city. So take a sprawling metropolis like Toronto, but Toronto has looked at the individual districts within the city and divided them into low density and high density areas. And you can see here the significant impact of density on all forms of energy use, the emissions across the board. So clearly this is a very important dimension in development. And uh, one which raises what I think is a core tension. Uh, this chart I think you'll be familiar with. Uh, it has been published by the Center for Livable Cities and it looks at the spread across global cities of livability as determined, I think, by Mercer, and also the density, how compact the city is. And you can see that, for the most part, the cities that are towards the right are towards the bottom as well. So for the most part, residents find livability associated with low density, with being able to have large back gardens, uh, being able to have spaces. And yet we have seen that compactness is very, very significant in terms of the future efficiency and livability of cities. And so indeed, you look towards those cities that are approaching more to the top right for future livability. So cities indeed, like Singapore, like London, like Hong Kong, like the Manhattan area of New York, which have both high density and high livability. They're highly attractive. And so this gives us 
the message that it is feasible to develop urban settings which are both attractive and compact. Trying to get our minds around this, I mean, clearly there are hundreds and hundreds of cities around the world, and they all have their unique features. So to get our minds around it, uh, we've looked at how can you divide up the landscape in a way that's useful for us. What are useful archetypes? What are useful patterns of urban form? And effectively, we've found we can divide up the landscape for our use into six basic archetypes. And there are features that are highly correlated within each archetype. But the basic areas are how prosperous a city is, its GDP per capita, how large its population is, uh, and how compact it is. And if you take those three factors, most other ways that cities have developed have similarities in terms of their uh, urban form. You know, so you can start with the uh, underdeveloped uh, urban centers. Uh, if you're maintaining in that area, which is relatively low prosperity, the emerging world, uh, you have the, um, the mega hubs that are forming there, and ultimately the underprivileged crowded cities. So you can think about, you know, in the first case, um, an Algiers or a Marrakesh or a Nanchong, uh, the mega hubs like Chongqing, uh, like Hyderabad, and uh, also then those uh, mega cities. I'm going to Manila in a couple of weeks' time, so Manila, an underprivileged, crowded city, uh, a lace. And then amongst the most prosperous cities, you have the smaller ones, like Amsterdam, where I flew from to come here, uh, like Stockholm like Dubai. Uh, you get the sprawling metropolises. I was a student a long time ago in Los Angeles. You, know, you look at Houston. Uh, you look at Rio de Janeiro. And then the urban powerhouses like Singapore, like Hong Kong, like Istanbul. So these are different forms, but we find them a very useful way of thinking, not in, about the over 500 cities with populations above 750,000 that were in the set that we looked at, but being able to think about it in terms of six forms. Just looking at these in terms of the GDP per capita and the population and the population density, the next question for us is in which way do cities develop? What are typical pathways for urban development? And again, we found we can grapple with this through six different pathway archetypes. Uh, clearly, you get slum proliferation. But you also get late stage growth, the kind of economic developments that are happening uh, and affecting Delhi and Mumbai. You have controlled urbanization. So moving from a small city into simultaneously larger forms with increasing prosperity. Uh, industrial modernization, staying small but growing. Uh, the development towards megacities. And also, of course, the negative side, urban decline. You know, there are many urban settings in the world that are in decline. So we found this useful. And you can see I've particularly highlighted here uh, controlled urbanization and late stage development. And that's because these are both ones which have a massive impact on resource use and particularly energy use. So if we look at these different pathways and look, say, out to... Um, 2025, so just over a decade, into where the growth in energy use is coming. It's coming through the developments along those pathways. And you can see that it's coming not just because of population growth, but because of that growth in prosperity. So clearly, if you're in an energy world, but also the related worlds of water, of 
higher end draws on food and agriculture from outside the city, you're looking at those pathways around the world in particular. So we found these helpful ways of dividing up what is an immensely complicated landscape. As I said, um, over 500 cities in the world with populations greater than 750,000. And just to give you a sense of that, that size and that scale, uh, I live in a city called The Hague in the Netherlands, and that didn't make it onto the list because it's too small at uh, half a million. So what is making the difference between which pathway is followed? Can we zoom in on lenses that help us get a sense of the dynamics of the transition, not just a description of the pathway? Well, we found it useful to think of the systems in which things transform. And if you look through this work on our new lens scenarios, you'll find lenses that we found useful for zooming in. For example, what we call pathway lenses or transition lenses. And there's more detail on that in this work. But if you begin to apply it into the city form, you think about you know, systems that drive urban development. And clearly, there's a, a virtuous circle However, it drives the wrong way. It can become a vicious circle. Uh, you know, one in which you have an area of competitive advantage. And that may be a locational advantage, which was the case uh, with Singapore. Or it may be an advantage due to particular knowledge access. Uh, it could be an advantage because particular uh, fiscal arrangements have been put in place, such as special economic zones in areas. Uh, through this, you're beginning to generate the funding and the attention and the growth in all kinds of capital uh, that enable investment. Investment from a municipal or government point of view in education, in amenities, in key infrastructures, but also the investment from the private sector in developing businesses, services, industries in an area. And all those amenities and capabilities and jobs attract talent. And that talent creates the opportunities to improve those competitive advantages. And there you have the virtuous circle. So the question then becomes, what is the balance of the facilitators of that positive circle versus the inhibitors of that? Because there are inhibitors. Even success breeds inhibitors as city areas become over-congested, become polluted, uh, or where the world outside the city changes and the competitive advantage is lost, is no longer relevant. And so our pathway lenses, the first one we call room to maneuver, that positive dynamic, and the second one we call trap transition, where things get stuck and even spiral into decline. So you think about it. You know the Singapore story better than I do. But I just look at it from the outside and see that you know, 50 years ago, much smaller population, just over one and a half million people, you know, a quarter of people living below the poverty line, almost a third of households in either slum or squatter areas. And you look at the Singapore now and how that virtuous circle has driven 50 years of progress and development. And of course, there are hiccups along the way. You know, there are times when there have been missteps, but overall, there has been that room to maneuver that has been created. So it doesn't stop things being turbulent, 
but it does mean that the direction of travel is constructive. And I just take as a contrast Detroit in the United States, which uh, in the 1950s had a population of, I think, about 1.8 million, uh, and it's now about 700,000. It had a GDP per capita that was the highest of any city in the United States. Uh, now it's got uh, a situation where 50% of the population are functionally illiterate, where a third of the land uh, is either derelict or vacant lots. So clearly that has been in that downward cycle. And that makes you know, a significant difference. It doesn't mean it has to be that way forever. And you have developments like blight busters, which are addressing this. But they're useful pathways to think about and think about the different forces that lead to that. So you know, we have found in great discussions with the Center for Livable City, five factors that really help create room to maneuver. And these are all linked. So clearly, flexible planning, very important. So whether that's been planning such as taking place in Singapore every few years, uh, from the original master plans back in the, the late 50s, through to the concept plan in 1971, supported by the United Nations, through to the plans in 1991 and now, uh, which set a direction of travel, but also to be flexible is important as well. And, and you can say whether how flexible it has been here, but it's a direction of travel, but recognizing that things change, things develop. The future isn't completely predictable, so you need to be able to adapt. So, you know, for example, uh, back in London, you had a setting of a aspiration uh, for a significant reduction in emissions uh, in uh, relative to 1990. But how that has been brought about is a variety of things that have adapted over time. So introducing congestion charging, introducing more cycling in the city, changing some building and zoning standards as well. So flexibility within that. Uh, consistent investment, very, very important. Just as a company like ours, whether the economy is up or down, we have to develop talent, recruit, all the time. And similarly, in city situations, important to keep that investment moving. Uh, so an example would be uh, in Berlin, where in 1997, it was agreed uh, between, if you like, the business community and the city authorities to uh, have uh, over 70% of new building uh, already equipped with uh, solar heating systems. Uh, had a big impact on the energy use uh, in the city. So again, investment there stimulated in the private sector. Uh, important to think about implementation, capacity, project management, but also you know, drawing in from plans into uh, new businesses that can help implement. So in Copenhagen, their plan for a, a, a carbon neutral Copenhagen by 2025 has encouraged over five years a 50% growth in green technology businesses in the area as well. Uh, important to think of uh, also there, uh, you can see this, this building of trust. Now clearly, in some parts of the world, that is a, a, about being able to address corruption and other basic issues, very, very, very important. But even as you look at the more advanced cities, transparency is a way of building trust between different sectors. So we have the example of, of Helsinki uh, as a city which has introduced a lot of uh, open information in which residents and the authorities can engage and uh, open up and build trust. And finally, the collaboration between different sectors. And that's a theme I'll re return to in a few minutes. So just as an illustration, you know, by 2030, it's anticipated that there will be 350 million additional Chinese in urban environments. That's huge. 
And we've done work with the uh, Policy Development Center associated with the Chinese State Council about energy pathways in China, but also one of those themes was the urban theme. And what we've discovered is that indeed, all that population growth could be contained within the, what we call the green edge of the current boundaries of current cities. You know, there's 480 cities currently in, uh, in China with a population of above, I think, 100,000 or so. And uh, these do not have to grow. They may well grow. They may well follow what the Chinese authorities refer to as the pancake model. But there's the opportunity within the current boundaries to densify. And that's built on a number of different factors. So first of all, and clearly, each city is different. You have to look at the inventory of the, uh, the city capacities, but also the ecosystem in which it's uh, sited. Uh, clearly, building efficiency is very important. Uh, in our outlook, uh, if you developed with efficient building standards towards, if you like, more global standards of building operation efficiency, residential energy use would decline by 40% compared to the default. Very, very important. Uh, clearly, reduce plot sizes so you don't encourage large developments. Uh, and flexible zoning. So going away from a model which says, well, industry is over here. Uh, retail is over here. Residential is over here. By having integrated models, you then get a, an opportunity to reduce travel and build communities, very important. And that really kind of goes on to two building blocks, what I call transit-oriented development and time-oriented development. You know, transit-oriented development is just really recognizing it's important to have this compactness, particularly around transit hubs, to introduce things like public transport, uh, bus rapid transit, not very expensive forms of, uh, of transport. Also microgrids where people can walk, where people can cycle. And time-oriented development is recognizing that success breeds pressures. More successful a city is, the more immigration there is, the more pressure there is on infrastructure. So thinking ahead in infrastructure terms and developing with that in mind. And clearly beginning to retrofit into this system the whole of the historical city core. So I'm just going to conclude now with what we're learning from this. Because we learn all the time. We don't have a lot of answers, but through these dialogues, we learn. So the first learning point I'd, I'd highlight is simply just that point of urban development being such a significant force. The resilience of it has a big impact on well-being for hundreds of millions, billions of people in the next decades ahead. Very valuable, we have found, to look at it in terms of politics, society, markets together. And we have found, and I hope you find, that these archetype lenses are a helpful way of dividing up the landscape and zooming in. This core challenge of being both compact and livable. But there are examples like Singapore which show that it can be addressed. So we can create room to maneuver, but it doesn't necessarily happen by itself. It takes attention. Systems perspective, very important. Across space and time, and by what I mean by that is, we think of the city as a geography, a location, and the value of having integrated water and waste and energy systems. But it's important to think of development over time. Think of it not just now, but what you're going to be facing in five, 10, 15 years time and already designing that into the infrastructure now. From an energy perspective, what we're seeing is that both clean and green are important. So cleaner fossil fuels, natural gas instead of coal, very important, not only from an energy efficiency point of view, but also from an emissions point of view, an air quality point of view. Ultimately, with carbon dioxide capture and storage to capture the greenhouse gas emissions. 
and this continuing revolution and growth in the renewables technology. Um, solar, for example, is, is not only growing, but its cost is coming down so quickly, we can see it's going to be a major part of the future. But in order to do this, it's the biggest lesson that we are learning, and we learn this in all our scenarios, is that tomorrow's success actually depends on how well government and business and civil society dance together. Now you think about it, you can tell from my age, right? I was a, a teenager of the 1970s. Yeah. I used to disco dance. <laughs> I am not going to demonstrate. <laughs> However, you know, kind of being on the floor on yourself, you know, you could do that. And so dancing alone is okay. Even dancing with one partner is doable. But dancing with three is harder. It takes a lot of attention towards choreography, towards building trust. And certainly, that's our big takeaway lesson, and where we're putting a lot of attention, and where I'm thankful for things like this cooperation that we've had with the CLC to bring this piece of work together, which again is a cross-boundary collaboration between the private and the public sector. So I'm going to leave it there with uh, these lessons. I hope there's something here that you can take away because you are influential in the way that cities develop. Not just Singapore, but in the world, Singapore is seen as a poster child for what many other cities would like to be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bentham. Um, Actually, can I invite you to please stay on stage? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, may I now invite Mr. Julian Goh and Professor Michael Kua uh, to join Mr. Bentham on stage for the panel discussion followed by the Q&A session. When the Q&A session begins, um, please state your name and organization before asking your questions or making comments. And um, my colleagues will be around with microphones, so they will pass them to you. So without further ado, um, I'll let Mr. Michael, Professor Michael Kwa begin with the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Yinshan. Uh, and thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, he gave us a truly philosophically and geographically global perspective of things. But then he uh, gave me a real good opening to, to introduce Julian, uh, and I, I believe Julian uh, will give you now a zoomed-in perspective because Jeremy mentioned, if you remember at the very end, he said Singapore is, is the poster child of cities. So while Jeremy has painted a truly uh, picturesque global view with uh, pathways and scenarios, I'd like Julian to then comment on the Singapore response and give us a more zoomed in view. Uh, so Julian, please. Um, hi everybody. I think um, I wouldn't try to do better than what Jeremy did. Um, I'm not gonna pretend I'm an expert in energy or in futures, but probably a more down to earth view of um, Singapore, which is what I'm familiar with. I think in the course of my work, I, I often have to deal with many overseas government officials. Um, and some of them will tell me that the secret of Singapore's uh, past is Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Um, and a majority of them would then follow up with a shrug of the shoulders and say, we don't have Lee Kuan Yew, uh, and so we can't do what you do. Um, but I think it will be a shame if we just explain it in terms of Lee Kuan Yew and one name. Um, Lee Kuan Yew and his team did a lot for Singapore uh, in the past. Uh, we cannot clone Mr. Lee. The technology doesn't exist yet. But what we can do is to distill the values and the principles of what they did. And these are the values and the principles that are universal, that's timeless, that cuts across time and space. So this is what CLC tries to do. Um, trying to pass down the knowledge, the, the principles for which our forefathers did, for which we are now enjoying, 
and trying to share this knowledge not just to Singapore but also to uh, countries and cities that are interested in the Singapore experience. Now, a bit more concrete on what uh, the first generation team did. For our friends and visitors who just visited or joined us more recently, you probably cannot imagine uh, Singapore in the 60s. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we had a riot in, in Little India. It was big news, front page. Singapore was shocked. Um, but I read about Singapore in the 60s. In 1955, we have about 275 strikes in one year. 275 strikes. Three days out of two, we have one strike. And Singapore is a very small place. When you have one strike, one part, you're talking about a strike in the whole of Singapore. There was a Singapore when we were a migrant state, uh, a country, not really a country, a British colony uh, of migrants from China, from India, from Malaysia, um, coming to this rock to try and make, make a better life. No sense of nationhood, no consensus. Uh, divided by ideology, uh, at the time communism was uh, ascending. So there was a context of the Singapore, a divided people. So the first thing that I think was very important is how uh, Mr. Lee and his team uh, bring people together, forge a common consensus. And in doing so, he had a very little window for which he created um, what we call sound institutions. Institutions like HDB, I think institutions like EDB, uh, proactive, uh, competent agencies that deliver the goods. Now, it is these agencies that through their implementation, through working together, that improve the life of the people. Uh, and when the people feel their life improving, they give more trust back to the political leaders. Uh, I want to say, in Jeremy's word, this is a sort of a system. You can't do with one part without the other. You can't have long-term planning without trust. Uh, you can't have trust if you don't, people don't see their way of life improving. Uh, and you can't make people's life improve, you do have sound institutions. So all this is interrelated. Um, this, if you like, is a bit more backwards on what we did. And I think uh, a bit more forward-looking, so what does it mean? Um, I want to say that I think it would be a, mis a mistake if you think that this system is one that can be on autopilot and we can just work it's done, server servant can go home and so on. Um, we call it dynamic urban governance because time change and governance has to change. Uh, if the first 50 years was one, a story about creating a framework, a system, sound institution, I think the big wave in the next 50 years is about how the, the government will work with the people. Um, I, I really like a, a quote from one of Shell's uh, New Lands book earlier. It goes, African prophet, which goes like this, if you want to walk fast, you walk alone. If you want to walk far, you walk together. In reality, as a small country, we want to walk fast, we also want to walk far. <laughs> we are a bit greedy, yeah? we want to walk fast, we have to walk far. Um, the challenge is then how, how can we do both? Um, I think Jeremy spoke in the last part about how the government working with the businesses and working with the people sector. Um, the story of Singapore in the past was sound institution and government taking the lead. But I think we all know um, each of these pillars, the, the, the government, the people sector, no, the public sector, the private sector, and the people sector, each have our own strength, our own weaknesses. Uh, and together as a whole, if all three engines are firing, I think the whole system is more resilient. Um, I also want to sort of preempt by saying that in a lot of other countries, the people sector is a bit stronger, partly because the public sector is weak uh, and, and the people sector fill up the space. Uh, I don't think we are going towards that model. The ideal stage is the government, people, the government sector is strong, the people sector is also strong. Uh, we cannot go down the other model. Thank you. Yeah, I know a lot of you are already itching to ask questions, so I, I hope uh, is that there, there are mics on both sides? So what, what, before I, I pass the mic to the audience, I'd just like to see that uh, th th there's a very interesting synthesis coming on, and I want to just use an American term because uh, I'm one of the strange guys who have actually lived in both these uh, cities. I've lived near Detroit, so I know what a trap transition looks like. So in fact, I, my wife just came from Detroit a few months ago. 
so, so, so uh, but what is very interesting that uh, Julian and Jeremy both said is the American term called herding cats. You can herd cattle very well, but the whole idea of trying to herd cats in a systemic way, uh, in a systems of systems way, becomes very interesting. So let's uh, open it up to the audience, because now I have to herd cats here. So if, uh, I hope you ask questions that uh, uh, don't pontificate on your point of view, but ask questions that, uh, that would be bring out more clarity from uh, each of the speakers here. Uh, anybody to go first? Could I take the, is there anybody up there? Uh, the, the, the threat I give audiences is, if you don't ask questions, unfortunately, you'll hear me. So I'd rather hear you, so please. Uh, Step up, yes. Raymond, uh, just. Hi, thank you very much, uh, Raymond Kwok from uh, Kwok Group LLP. Uh, hi, thank you very much, Jeremy, for a fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, what I was listening, while you're listening, all the economics and energy uh, scenario was painted. Uh, what I feel missing is the softer sides of life, uh, livable city index and all that. I'm talking about uh, do we have sort of uh, archetype including insight there and assessments of how people spend their leisure time, how many museums actually we have and all that inside there. And uh, the only, you know, I'm looking through and I don't see any inside the analysis. And the only picture I saw was somebody else in a swimming pool. I, I, re, I, I scanned through the two, two, uh, two booklet. So maybe that, that there may be something that uh, people like, I do not know whether in the future cities that we have a melting pot uh, or are we working in a city then go to Seychelles to have leisure, you know. <laughs> uh, thanks for the, uh, the question and for raising, you know, what, what is a very important point? And you know, clearly uh, any of our work, whether it's a presentation or, or a booklet like that, kind of is a summary of, of the thinking. But um, the socio-political aspect of urban development is massively significant also again in global terms. Uh, if we think about it, um, where there is social tension, it concentrates in urban settings. And all politicians recognize that. You know, we have had the tensions you know, in Taksim Square, in Tiananmen Square. All these urban settings are where they're expressed. And so, you know, clearly, uh, the quality of city development and city livability is in the foreground of political minds. Or if it isn't, it should be, because if it isn't, those politicians are not going to be in place for a long time. So just thinking about it from that angle is a concentration on city livability. Now, we sense that city livability going forward is going to be increasingly um, needing to be aware of the resource draw. Because we do see uh, supply demand tensions in resources. Uh, if you look out to 2030, you know, 40 to 50 percent more fresh water requirements, more food requirements, more energy requirements in the world. So uh, you know, just think about the cost of that or the waste products of that, very important. So we do think about those systems, uh, but none of those systems develop in a way that is effective and efficient without the city being attractive to people to live there and to support those developments. So it has to be attractive and, and clearly you know, uh, fun. And uh, I, yeah, I was very pleased Whenever it was, was it, was it last year or two years ago? When, when did the new botanical gardens open here? What and a half years. I remember being here when, when those opened, and it was just kind of a fantastic, fun place to be. And and, and that sense uh, is important. I used to live in London, and London's a great place to be. So uh, these are important factors and are not ignored by us, but they're kind of put into that kind of context. Any question? Yeah, please. Hi, um, my name is Wei Mei. I'm from the National Climate Change uh, Secretariat. Uh, I just have a quick question. 
Um, as cities develop, they become more complex systems. And I was just wondering, uh, does the panel have any advice for policymakers on how to create um, system level solutions? I mean, especially taking into consideration um, the confluence of water, energy, and food. I mean, things like that, systems level solutions for the whole economy. Uh, how, how do you plan for that? And how do you implement that? And how do you assess the trade-offs um, that you're experiencing? Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for raising a very important point, uh, what we call the stress nexus, the fact that water, energy, and food are very closely related. Uh, and so if you get tensions in one area, they amplify tensions in other areas. So these stresses don't evolve linearly, but they feed off each other. But equally, solutions then have a big impact on moderating all the, uh, the stresses. And um, uh, recognizing indeed that there is a system and then putting in coherent policies uh, around that. So I mentioned I flew in here from Amsterdam. And uh, Amsterdam, I was really impressed. I, I went recently to the, the center that they have there where they have uh, all their water treatment and water management. Water is very important in the Netherlands because there wouldn't be a Netherlands without good water management. Uh, but also the waste management and power generation. So they're integrating those systems uh, and have many households connected to the, um, what would otherwise be waste heat, district heating systems. Uh, and a plan that uh, I think in about 20 years time, half the households in Amsterdam will be uh, on district heating. Uh, the waste to power is very important. In fact, uh, Amsterdam, or this facility now, is uh, treating waste that's imported from the UK, where uh, it's more efficient to do that than to keep using landfill uh, in the UK. Amsterdam is a city in which um, just about, just under 60% of people in the city cycle each day. And so that way of also setting up transport in, in a way that you not only have really good public transport, but you also have private transport, but by bicycle. Uh, and so indeed, all these systems working together is important to be effective, but it's doable. And that, that was just giving you another example. I think indeed the um, complex system thinking and the, the notion that each part is connected to the other is the key and the million dollar question going forward. Um, but just looking at our own experience, the, the, the principle of working together in an integrated way is probably one of the key pillars which help us along the way. I think many of you might be familiar with the water story, but the water story is not just water itself. It really started with the cleaning of Singapore. Um, we are short of water. To collect water, we need to collect clean water. And that, that's not possible unless Singapore is clean, no pollution-free, strict controls on factories, uh, and making sure that the whole place is sewered up and properly and drained properly. Um, and a lot of overseas visitors come and hear about our new water story. Um, they will come and see the, 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 the gallery and the fancy plant. I will tell them the hard work is in the integration. The hard work is in, in laying the every single drain, little drain, laying the every single uh, sewage, and how that connects to the building, that how, how that is played out in the roads when we plan and design for. And this uh, is a very simple thing. It's not a fancy plan, but how we connect the whole system. And I mean, for us, um, what's important is the mindset among the people, but not so much the technology. Uh, that, that's what we see. Um, technology will be there, companies will have innovative solutions, but how Singapore has been able to pull it off is not that we came out with some fancy technology, we came out with some, but really how we work together in the integrated way, how whether it's public officials, private companies and the people sector, sort of look across each other's domain and ask themselves, what is it that I do that affects other people in other sectors? I think that's the part that we need to overlay to make sure we are ready for a more uh, complex future. Yeah, I, I know as a moderator, I'm not supposed to answer questions, but uh, I'll, I'll take a quick look at it. Uh, 
from, from the Detroit viewpoint, for, for those of you who don't know. I, I truly believe that the two speakers have really focused on the need for systems integration and for technology. But uh, for being a technical guy, I've always ended a lot of my technology talks by saying that technologies are absolutely necessary conditions, but they are totally insufficient. And, and, and it is the insufficiency, and let me give you the Detroit question because it's how you frame it. The trap transition that Shell talked about, the Detroit view, is very simple. Detroit, as you well know, made it, it's the Moto City. So those of you who know Motown and the music that you can dance to, uh, is, was really focused on the, the private automobile because the US is sprawling cities. So now every time I ask in Detroit a transportation question, I say, you know, how do you solve it? They think of it as a car problem. You see the difference when a transportation problem is equated to the technology of a car, that's when you get trapped in your mind. And so uh, I, this is as an anecdote to explain that the, the framing the question is an important one. So uh, I will ask a question of the two speakers because I, I've always, uh, I'm originally from Malaysia but I spent most of my adult career in the US. So I've always envied Singapore. Uh, and this is for Jeremy and also for Julian. In a lot of cities around the world that you've studied, there is a native hinterland. Singapore does not have a hinterland. It is a city unique in of itself. So clearly, your, the interest of Singapore initially was reasons of energy security, food security, water security. And now it's a question of resilience. It's for Jeremy, uh, what other cities of the world do you see this issue where you have to become resilient without a native hinterland? And then Julian, uh, beyond LKY, which gives you the mountains view of things, uh, what next uh, to, to look at in, in a city which has really prospered without a natural hinterland? Uh, what have you learned? To, how have you learned to do it right? Malaysia did it wrong, and I'm from Malaysia, so I can say it. <laughs> uh, obviously, the, the situation for Singapore is, is pretty unique, you know, the, the city-state. Uh, and so uh, I, I'll let Julian kind of obviously speak to, to that experience. Uh, but in many ways, you know, what you are seeing, particularly in those places where you are going to be developing these more compact cities, uh, is uh, the opportunity to have the advantages of that by almost like setting the city boundaries, but recognizing that the city does uh, form part of a, of a broader ecosystem. So recognizing all the uh, ecological, all the water flows that are associated with that. Uh, and I'm just going to connect to something else rather than the hinterland question at the moment because uh, it was something that was raised by Julian, which I think is significant for that systems integration area, which is just re-emphasizing this importance of um, system systemic institutions. Uh, the, um, you know, with Detroit, uh, what happened was that effectively you also had about 300 uh, local institutions not coordinating, not financing what was going downhill. Uh, if I is working for Shell, look, we're techie people. You've you got that impression, right? We're technological people. We're a technological company. But if I come to speak with, for instance, a government, it makes a big difference if I'm coming to a place like Singapore where you kind of know who to speak with, or if I'm speaking, say, in India, where there isn't even an energy ministry. You know, there's a coal ministry, there's a gas ministry, there's an oil ministry. Uh, if you take a city, and you're talking about these kinds of cities, like Venice, uh, Venice is, I, I don't know whether you've been there, Venice is one of the most marvelous places in the world, and I am so afraid it's just going to sink. It's going to be lost, and it's going to be lost because there are layers and layers of different institutions 
who believe that they're responsible for doing something and nobody is herding the cats. So things aren't happening. So I hope there will be a dramatic reset when it gets so bad that, that things uh, change. But this integrated institutions is very important. And I think that they can be created at municipal level and can be part of that uh, not distinguishing the rural and the hinterland and the city, but them working together because the city itself is stronger. Well, um, Singapore never had a hinterland. We wanted a hinterland with Malaysia, but of course that didn't happen. Um, so, so what I think the, the leaders did wisely is to look at the world as the hinterland, um, being connected, not just in ASEAN or Asia, but being connected glo globally. So if you think about shipping, um, Singapore and Rotterdam, think about airports, uh, those were the hard infrastructure we invested in the 80s. Uh, now we are talking about connecting data so we have a lot of data centers, or the fibers come through Singapore. And of course, we are connecting people, talents, humans, us. Um, I think it was very clear uh, that the world doesn't need Singapore. Uh, so we have to make ourselves connected to the world. So the, we want the world to come through us, to come to us. Uh, and the concept of Singapore as a node connected firmly to the world. Uh, this is an existential question, you know, making sure that we're always connected, always relevant to the world, uh, thinking about that, making ourselves, adapting ourselves to that. Okay, now I want to ask the world a question because I thought those are very, very, uh, they're almost uh, complementary views. One is that the city itself uh, can be resilient and then the fact is the world is now the hinterland for Singapore. Question? Hello, my name is John Powers. I work at the uh, Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities at SUTD. Mr. Bentham, thank you for a very, very interesting, thought-provoking presentation. I guess my only question to you, sir, is, um, is your, the way you talked about trust and the importance of trust building uh, in the way that city managers and places retain their significance or create new forms of advantage. Is, I guess I just wanted your thoughts on that in relationship to another trend that seems to be affecting a lot of cities around the world, particularly in my home country, which is the United States, which is that many cities around the world are becoming places of drastically increasing inequality. And I wanted to get your thoughts on what the relationship, how you see the relationship evolving between rising inequality and the need to uh, to build trust, because in so many ways that trust, which seems so crucial for stronger city economies, is being eroded. Thank you. Again, wonderful uh, points being made. Thank you for that, uh, that point. And indeed, if um, you're able to look through the, the larger New Lens scenario piece of work, uh, you will see that we also kind of highlight this as an issue, uh, because globalization has looked differently according to who you are. Uh, yeah, effectively, if you look across households across the world, uh, the, the globally poor have remained globally poor despite urbanization. Uh, you've got a rising but still relatively poor middle class in the world. Uh, you've got a developed middle class in the world, which on the whole hasn't benefited in real terms from globalization in the last uh, 20 years. And then you've got a, if like, a privileged um, percentage, a top 10% if you like, uh, which has benefited. And the world looks very different. And you see these tensions building up. You see in a country like China, the tensions uh, between the rising middle class and the established privileged. Uh, in uh, Europe, where I'm from, and in the United States, you see this big tension between the uh, squeezed middle class and the highly privileged. So I do think it's a very important area, uh, and, and we do you know, see that um, uh, as being 
a real driver in our scenarios. So I mentioned the world of mountains is one in which advantage continues to build advantage, so that um, even across the generations, those who are most privileged are able to uh, ensure the best education for their offspring, which brings them into privileged positions. So you get lock in, but you also get lock out. But there are other dynamics explored in the oceans world <coughs> in which new interests are accommodated, partly because of pressure from the new interests, but also because the influential recognize that their influence being stable depends on accommodating the interests of others. So I do think it's an important factor. And it will have an influence on city development. Uh, we talk about these lenses and these archetypes because it's helpful in addressing them and thinking about them. But clearly within a city, you can have both room to maneuver and trap transition going on. You know, so clearly you can develop a city form which has uh, prosperous, gated communities which are disconnected from uh, trapped, uh, impoverished areas. And uh, I think we've all seen, uh, and uh, in your country, by the way, which I love, I was largely educated there, uh, you see that happening. Uh, but you also see the positive things. Um, I'll just give an example. I'm, I'm sorry, it doesn't relate to your question precisely. But I was privileged enough to do my first grad studies in uh, Los Angeles, in Pasadena. And I remember the air quality in Pasadena in 1979-80, and it reminds me of Beijing now. Uh, you go to Los Angeles now, and it's very, very different in, in air quality terms. So over a period of a couple of decades, you can see these changes. And I suspect that these kinds of social pressures that you raise will continue to be significant, and they will resolve and develop and change over the next 20 years for good or bad. Well, I'm glad that the um, issue of inequality is something which is global, which of course Singapore is facing. I like the example of how in the past, in the 70s, I, I understand in Premier League in football, the lowest uh, paid footballer and the highest paid footballer, the factor is small, but today the, the best footballer obviously command a global price because everyone wants to see the global player in action, you know. Uh, so this is a global problem. So Singapore is trying our own to, um, to fix this. And I think, back to the African proverb, if you want to move fast, you move alone. You know, move far, you move together. So we have to move together, Singapore as a whole. Um, uh, and I think the political leaders have made their statements very clear, uh, something which they are looking at. Um, education had been our main, if you like, um, weapon of choice as a leveler. And I think we should do more to make it every child, every, every single person who is born, an equal start in life as far as we can. And I think this is one area that we have to look out for in Singapore. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Hi, good morning. I'm uh, JJ. I'm currently at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and in, in the process of joining the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities. So I'd like to pick up the issue on collaboration between the government and its people. So particularly in developed cities, highly developed cities like Singapore, we find that perceivable improvements of people's lives are becoming highly marginal. Everybody certainly has access to amenities, to, to the basic necessities of life. Uh, in this situation, what, what drives this uh, trust between uh, people and its government? What makes up the social compact, so to speak, uh, between, that drives the collaboration that Mr. Bentham has mentioned between government, businesses, and civil society? Thank you. I think you, you, you want a process where, okay, first of all, we as a society in Singapore is a lot more educated, people well-traveled, well-educated, and we have a lot of ideas among the people. Now, how do you then have a process of divergence and convergence? Uh, we want people to, to want to contribute their ideas. We want to harness the ideas of people, and the government recognizes and put up their hand, I don't have all the ideas, all the solutions to your problems. So how can we have a, a process or understanding that we, 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 we can have a divergence process where we, we genuinely 
get ideas and views from people. Uh, but if we leave it as that, we, will, we can and we run in the danger of paralysis. Everyone wants to go in one direction and all the directions are different. Uh, and that becomes hardened. And I think you can see how it plays out in, in other cities, in other countries where they are paralyzed. So having a good divergence process, but at the end of the day, you still need someone to make the call to bring everyone together, to persuade all the different segments together and say, look, um, this is the pathway we as a whole got to come to a consensus. Uh, we, so we have to have the rules of this, you know, uh, agree to disagree uh, at, at a certain process. And the second thing I wanted to share is, um, I guess what uh, Carrie Lam shared when she was in Singapore. I think Hong Kong and Singapore has many similarities. So she, she once said to me, which I think was quite useful, um, of course, there are always certain things that we don't, we don't go through these people engagement, you know, defense, national security, terrorism, if you act, you have to act. There's no sort of divergence. Uh, but if the government is able to demonstrate uh, in the occasions where it has to do so, that it's genuinely uh, listening and, and talking to the people, then, and the trust is built up, then you don't have to go back for every single decision that you have to make. Uh, you know, someone asked me about things like referendum, you know, doesn't mean we have to go to the people for every single decision, but that will be a sign of a weak government. Uh, a, a, a government that has trust is one that has the mandate of people to deliver and to, to, to carry on, um, for which you don't go to the people for every single thing. Thank you. Okay, we'll take one last question before I ask for uh, closing reflections from the two panelists here. Any uh, last question from the audience? Any burning questions? If there isn't a burning question, can I just ask sure. to, to, to add to something yeah. uh, on that trust? Because, uh, as I said, I, I'm uh, the head, but the brain is outside the head. And uh, I'm going to put James on the spot. If I could put you on the spot, James, if you could get a, a microphone to him. Because I want to put this in the global context, because we're used to how we are in, in a prosperous communities uh, and the trust issues there. Uh, but James has been doing quite a lot of work on trust in very different settings. I think it's just useful, James, if you could stand up, just share a little bit of what you're learning about trust in those settings. Sure, thank you, Jeremy. And that was really unexpected, so. <laughs> <coughs> Forgive me if I'm not as articulate as Jeremy. Um, so I've just spent the last four or five years working, focusing very much on our relationships with stakeholders in Nigeria. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Nigeria, with the oil industry in Nigeria and, and Shell in Nigeria. It's a troubled, long relationship, and trust is at the heart of many of the problems today. They've evolved over many, many years and decades. The question is, how do you rebuild trust when there's been a catastrophic loss of trust, and particularly in the Niger Delta where oil is, is um, generated? It is a low-intensity conflict zone. So we reached out last year and did a comparative study looking at how other large institutions which share some of the characteristics of a multinational corporation in terms of the way they're run by processes, practices and guidelines. We looked to similar large institutions such as militaries, the US, international militaries, NATO, the World Bank, the UN, to see how they had experienced in different locations around the world catastrophic loss of trust and how they tried to rebuild it, and what were some of the very practical techniques that they used. What you find is in, in very difficult organi um, environments, trust is so weak that the smallest misstep or miscommunication can be fundamental uh, so that your underlying intentions are mistrusted and everything is then looked at through a prism of uh, mistrust and worst case scenario, mistrust of motives. What we understood as well out of this comparative research was that before you can build external trust, it's vital to have internal trust as an organization so you've got aligned understanding of your goals and expectations and that from the top of the organization down to the frontline staff, and in the case of Shell, that would be people out there working in communities, community liaison officers, but also pipeline repair people, that there's an aligned set of interests which then gives those people at the front line the room to maneuver, to, sorry to borrow a phrase, but I think it's appropriate in this operational context, 
that they can then have that internal engagement in Shell to, under, to, to allow senior managers to understand that this is a very different environment to, to other places where we might operate. It will take more resources, more time, and more collaborative forms of getting from A to B, where you have to bring in partners from the communities, from regulatory agencies, in a way which you wouldn't have to do in other environments. So we found that there was a lot of similarities, and it's, we're very early in that journey. But collaboration, again, across those boundaries, across those sectors, uh, is part of the solution. So I'll thanks, leave it there. thanks for that, James. And indeed, um, so it is possible to rebuild trust, but it's best not to lose it. And so you know, the investment before you need it is very significant. One of our senior execs recently, we were talking about things, said, uh, make your friends before you need them. Uh, and so I would say in whatever that means in the Singapore context, make your friends before you need them. Okay, I will ask uh, the, the two panelists to, to, to close, but to, uh, I'll sort of frame the closing a little bit because of the trust issue. In Detroit, uh, which I'm very familiar with, uh, we, the, the last but one mayor is, is so well trusted that he's now in jail on RICO ca uh, uh, charges, which is racketeering and all of that. And, and that's what is one example of failed leadership from, from the mountaintop. Because here was a, a leader who clearly got his leadership position through uh, gerrymandering the votes and all of that. And so he's now so trusted he's in jail. So that's the trap transition. So in the context of summing up where you have clearly articulated the need for the dance between the three Ps, public, private, um, and the people, uh, where does leadership or municipal leadership, uh, either within the collective or single mayor or city leader, uh, where does this, how do you sort of get it done, rebuild it, or if, uh, not lose it if you already have it. Um, summarize your thoughts on this city's resilience question on, on trust and leadership. Well, um, I, I probably would sort of look at the whole panel discussion and the dialogue that we had and sort of paint out the broad strokes. I think, um, first of all, Singapore is, I think we are very humbled that shall pick us as a good reference in, in the publication. Um, we are humbled by that. Um, and I think at the start, Singapore did receive a lot of help um, from United Nations, um, from Albert Winsemius, who came to advise us from the Dutch. And I think it is the same spirit that hopefully our reference is useful for other cities. So this is what uh, I want to say, number one. Uh, number two is what I said. You know, I, I don't want people to go away thinking Singapore is LKY, one-man show, but really what are the principles and ideas behind the man? Uh, that those are the things that's timeless. Uh, so through distilling it, uh, what CLC has done is try to distill what this leadership is, what are the, what's behind the skin, and try to break this, this down into a useful language for which other cities hopefully can find useful. Uh, and so far we have done some programs, talk to mayors, uh, work on projects, hopefully um, to get them uh, to, try to, 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 to get them to understand the principles. And by doing so, um, we build trust with these cities uh, because ultimately, uh, sort of if you zoom out and look at the future of the world, the globe, climate change, we do need a strong network of cities to act, um, to share knowledge, to push each other, and you do need a level of trust uh, to, do, to do that. Now, that is external view, if you like, of what we do. Now, internal view of Singapore as a country needing trust between the people and the government is something that's work in progress, something that will never be done, never be a finished piece, something that we have paying a lot of attention to to make sure the next 50 years will be better than the past 50 years. So this is what we are doing now. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much indeed. Leadership is indeed one of the fundamental factors that makes a difference between whether we get adrift to a worst of all worlds or can really pull together, in our scenario terms, the best of both worlds. And it becomes ever more important and ever more difficult for the reasons that were raised 
earlier, which is that the stresses in the world are naturally crossing the kinds of traditional boundaries that have evolved under the pressures of the past. So whether you're talking about financial pressures or market pressures or environmental pressures, social pressures, these are crossing boundaries. So more and more of those interested parties or cats have to be engaged in making progress, as you were saying, going together, and it becomes ever more difficult to do that. So it is something that we have to just continually invest in. And if there is one thing that I think I've learned from, from my role is the value of looking through the eyes of others in a situation. Because we're all victims of our own pasts. And we think that people see things in the same way as we do, where in fact they can see things very, very differently. And the scenario approach is actually a practical tool for getting that out on the table. Because you don't get just advocating particular positions, but you have an opportunity to get different perspectives out on the table and explore them collectively. Uh, I'm very mindful of the fact that not only as a company do we try to do that, but how we've seen that elsewhere. Uh, here in Singapore, there has been a long tradition of using scenarios to think about things. I don't know the extent to which that has been done in broad public settings. But back, you know, Nelson Mandela has just passed away. You know, South Africa, back in the early 90s, everybody expected a bloodbath, and yet it didn't happen. And I know one small contribution to that was the so-called Montfleur scenarios that were developed that helped see that there were high roads and low roads and helped the different parties to recognize they had a mutual interest in taking the high road. Uh, and I'm very proud of the fact that a member of my team, long before my time, was one of the facilitators who helped set up that Montfleur dialogue. And obviously it was good for him because uh, I think he married the co-facilitator and settled in <laughs> South Africa uh, afterwards. But, but I would say that, you know, think of, look through the eyes of others, really try and walk in the boots of others. And techniques like the scenario approach are a technique that can really help that dialogue and to build understanding and trust. So thank you very much, Julian. Thank you, Jeremy. And in the context of this situation, if you cannot look through the eyes of another, at least put on new lenses. <laughs> uh, off to you. Thank you very much, um, Jeremy, Julian, and Professor Kua. Um, please stay on stage. Um, thank you very much again for sharing your um, insightful um, experiences and for the really insightful discussion. Now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Lee Zhu Yang, Chairman of Shell Companies in Singapore, and uh, Mr. Ku Teng Chai to join the panel on stage for photo taking. Um, please. And um, I believe all of you have taken a copy of the book, which uh, is available outside. So please enjoy reading the book. Thank you, everyone. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the book launch and talk. Thank you for your participation today.